side of the harp, everything in here is removable. You have the burn box, and that can go kind of on the side over here. You have uh, the elevator tower system that moves the griddle grate up and down. Okay. You have um, the walls inside of the harp is uh, built uh, so you can put uh, hook uh, grill crates onto it or you can hook This episode is brought to you by Restaurant Systems Pro With excitement, allow me to introduce to you, I want to say back on the show for a second time, but technically this is the first time you're being featured on the show. There's a little story behind that. We'll get into it. The founders of Grills by DeMont, Chris and Anne DeMont, are you two feeling unstoppable today? Yes. Very much. Yeah. So that story is we were in Atlanta a few months ago, November. Um, we came here. There was a power outage like just before we, we got here. Uh, and you called me. Do you remember that phone call? Yeah. What were you thinking? Were you were? <laughs> I was just thinking typical. I mean, this would just happen for us, you yeah. know. <laughs> well, we made it. We came. Yeah. We recorded. Um, the audio the audio quality wasn't great. This is so grills by Demont. We're in a, basically a manufacturing m- manufacturing plant right now where they're building these beautiful grills. We didn't have light in this warehouse, so I was like. We got to come back. We, we got to do this a second time and do it right and give you guys the respect you deserve because you're hustling. And honestly, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you because you've been so generous with your network. And I mean, the most amazing restaurant tourists from across the country are, are buying your grills right now. So you know who's who and you're you introduce us to a lot of amazing people. So thank you guys so much. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Awesome. So before we get into who you are and how we, you got to where you are today, let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? I'm going to say either um, work hard and play hard or work hard and smart. Work hard and play hard or work hard and just do it all, or right? Or do it both. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> awesome. Uh, do you have anything you want to add to that, Ian? No, I think that's good. I mean, that says a lot about who we are. Yeah, and it, it, I mean, you are good people. Um, you definitely bust your asses here. I can't wait to capture uh, the process after the the recording. But where does it make sense to share your start sharing your story? What what is, what is your story? Like when, like how long have you guys even been in business? I mean, we've been in business um, since 2015, but we didn't make grills to begin with. Uh, the grill kind of came along by you know coincidence. Uh, and then it took off from there uh, in 2017. Um, uh, but Chris has an a background yeah. in food equipment, so yeah. he already knew a lot. And there's a little bit of an uh, uh, an accent we're picking up on. Where are we from originally? We're from Denmark, um, and I think our story probably goes back to when we met. And within the first week, Chris said, "If this is going to be us, we are not going to be like anybody else." Mm. Wait, and the first week you met you yeah. s- like you knew each other yeah this was the conversation yeah wow the What's following up? week yeah the following week we'd only known each other for a few weeks we went over here on vacation and he said i would like to live here and then we worked on that for you know my way through college and figuring it all out so from day 1 we kind of had a goal yeah that we did not want to be like anybody else so chris and Anne demont we're not married or sorry, we're not brothers and sisters we're married mm-hmm. uh and you how long have you guys known each other since 2009 2009 yeah. going back yeah. okay so 14 13 years approximately mm-hmm. um what were you doing in, in denmark before coming stateside i worked as a, a stainless steel um fabricator and um in denmark that's a basically a four-year degree so you can choose uh, what kind of uh, if you want to be a metal worker what kind of metal worker do you want to be do you want to be in you know uh, mild steel fabrication do you want to be in shipbuilding do you want to be in in structural steel um, uh, do you want to be a plumber um, or do you want to be a stainless steel so why stainless builder? steel what was and I, by the way i think that is the most sexy job I don't know why. It's something about working with – if you love kitchens and you love clean kitchens and you have the ability to, like, literally create whatever you can imagine and having that skill set in a kitchen, commercial kitchen, just feels so sexy to me. I don't know why. Uh, but what was the appeal for you? Yeah, it's a good question because I was 15 or 16 years old when I 
decided I wanted to be a stainless steel fabricator. You're fortunate to know what you want to do to yeah. at that age to have to, to know is super fortunate. Whatever. Yes, ever since I can remember, I knew I was going to be a, a builder for a lo- for the first you know few years. I was um, I wanted to be a carpenter, and then when I became a teenager, I was like, I want to do metal work because that seemed like it was more difficult. I wanted to do something that was, um, you know, where I could build more stuff. And it's challenge pretty, it's pretty manly, too, metal work, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that influenced Yeah, but there's more, I think, the freedom aspect yeah. in it. I always wanted to be, you know, self-reliant and just being able to do what I want, you know, build whatever I wanted to build. So why does metal fabrication, specifically stainless steel metal fabri- fabrication, give you that freedom why is there a freedom associated with that because it's basically you know a, w- a metal fabricator can do woodwork but a woodworker can't do metal fabrication mm. so in that sense it gives you more freedom and like literally like you can create whatever you can imagine yeah. you know if you have the exactly tools, which and, I think is cool. and stainless steel is more difficult to work with than uh, than some other steels, so if you can do the stainless, you can do the others, but not the other way yeah. around. It's the so same yeah, principle. Yeah. So what are the challenges you that are unique to stainless steel? Stainless steel um, is very alive, so basically you can't put any heat into it Would when you're building with it, other otherwise it's going to want to warp. Okay. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of tricks of the trade. So like you say very alive, you mean it it's it influenced by temperature? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. Basically, you want to build it without putting any heat into it, which you can't do that. So it's a contradiction. That and you, you built a workshop in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> does yeah. It, does and seriously, does it get hard? And doing live hard? fire yeah. Yeah. equipment. It, yeah. But it works good in the sense that it has a higher melting point than uh, yeah. than other metals. So it, it works good for grills because um, uh, it's going to last longer. These grills it's take... It's not going to warp. Every time it you spark gonna, it up, it's... It might warp a little bit, but um, not it's not going to melt away like um, other steels would. Got it. Um, and um, in the long run, it holds up better, I think. Yeah, yeah. So y- you knew from an early age you wanted to get into metal fabrication, specifically steel and then stainless steel. Um, what were you doing for work? Like how long... So if you came here in 2015, um, you guys met in 2009, were you already working with metal at this point? Yeah, in Denmark, I, really in Denmark, I, I was working in, um, with industrial food equipment, um, and we did that all the way up till we, we uh, came over here. So it give me some example of like some of the stuff, like the food equipment, but like like what? Like so it's very, in, no, no, very industrial food equipment. There was uh, in everything you can imagine that would be inside of a huge uh, food plant. Like or pharmaceutical, ph- pharmaceutical, or like, any, like sterile environment. Yeah, very sterile. So everything inside those factories are custom made. Yeah. And everything is stainless steel. Okay. So it's very much like um, you know these grills are you know in the same principle. So yeah, but it was everything from big tanks to contain uh, powder or conveyor belts or yeah, you know a, a packaging machine that can put a lid on on a on a package um, and it can do a uh, 100 per minute <laughs> yeah but at any point where you was it food uh, the association of working adjacent to food or is, is food not necessarily your thing is it more just the no, I, I always been into cooking yeah. and and barbecue in Denmark uh, there's no such thing as low and slow cooking and there's no there's no barbecue restaurants and I always um, wanted to have you know, taste barbecue in Denmark, so I had to learn to make it myself. So I did make a, a couple smokers in Denmark also. Nice, nice. So uh, what? P- so 2015 is when you guys come to America. Um, you didn't know what you wanted to do at that point, though, right? You know you wanted to work with metal, but you didn't know. I, I knew um, in Denmark I had a, a, um, a few years where I, f- I thought it was really interesting to build furniture. So after work uh, in those uh, companies I worked at, I would build our own furniture. Was it steel furniture? Steel and wood nice. furniture. Nice. Now I want you one of your patio settings. Or yeah. set, uh, what do I want to say? Patio. Uh, I don't know if you make that. If you're still doing that, but uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the market for some patio furniture right now. No, I, we never <laughs> did any, any uh, outdoor furniture. Nice. Uh, and I want to make sure. Is there any part of your story that is worth sharing in the, the in, in mm, the early I days? I mean. Not really, I think. I mean, I went to college. I was in the 
healthcare industry, but unfortunately I was in an accident uh, very early on in my college years that prevented me from maybe going the direction I wanted. What did you want to do? I wanted a PhD in in uh, health economics, and today I feel almost lucky about my accident because I wanted to do that to prove people wrong mm. that I couldn't do it. And I still not think... Not the right reason. Yeah, not the right reason. I still think that I proved people wrong because I'm here and I'm doing something that nobody had believed in doing. Um, and, and when it came to us choosing what we wanted to do, I said, okay, I have some, some limitations physically uh, from my accident. So what, what is your dream? How can we combine what, what we want to do? Um, and, and that's kind of how we made it happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of remind. So when I was a commercial pilot, that's a big reason why I became a commercial pilot was because I wanted to prove people wrong. I always struggled in school, you know, school mm-hmm. wasn't like my strength and people were like, are you sure it's going to be really hard for you to be a commercial pilot? And I was like, screw you, watch me do it. Yeah. And they were right. It was really hard, <laughs> <laughs> but I did it, you know? Yeah. And I, uh, but at the same time, I think there's a lesson in here. Like that's not a good enough reason to pick a career path. Yeah. You need to truly be passionate about what the work you're doing. Uh, and it seems like you, you stumble upon your passion, you know, like it. it yeah. I think it c- for me, it came t- down to the passion was maybe not health economics or the industry. It was the numbers. And that's also what I do here. I juggle the numbers. Mm. Uh, in any sense so that's uh, actually a great like and i, I want to get into this but we're kind of getting there now like how do you two complement each other like what like what lanes are you we in? stay in our own lane i think so <laughs> you're I would, I would say chris you're you're like a technician you're you're the person who does the thing the skilled yeah. worker right what 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 qualities do you think you have Anne? i mean it's definitely that i i can see like the big picture of if we do this, this is going to happen. Mm. And if we do this, we are gonna get in so and so situation. Um, I'm also very opinionated about what he builds. So he knows that I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna have an opinion of whether it's good enough or not. And then he's gonna be, you know, annoyed for a day or two and uh, then he's going to Chris is staring, she staring criti- at the she ceiling right now she criticizes everything <laughs> I do <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not necessarily a critique it's more of a I know you can do better mm. but there's also a point where I know I can do that with him but you can't just you know that's a, that's also a cultural thing that we come from that it's okay to say to people you can do better mm. And it's not a personal critique. It's a how do we get you to that level of being better. And that has been a struggle for us over here because it's been sometimes perceived wrong uh, that it's a personal critique and it's never a personal critique. We just want to, we want everybody to be the best they Mm. can be. I love that. I love cultural differences in studying. Like it's one thing I hope to do with this podcast is to go and to study culture, uh, hospitality in different cultures and what hospitality and how that manifests in different cultures. Um, there's so much diversity in culture. It's really fascinating to get that perspective sometimes. Uh, so I think now is actually a really great time to take our first break to thank our sponsors. And then we'll come back to talk about how you guys and your unique lanes, your unique skills, how you guys as entrepreneurs started your business. It wasn't Girls by DeMont then. What, what, what was the company you guys started when you first came here? Was it just... Fabrication by demand, furniture uh, by demand. It was a uh, reclaimed by demand. <laughs> okay. Um, doing furniture. All right, yeah. we'll, we'll uh, come old, back. Old style furniture. We'll we'll come back and we'll start talking about that. We have to interrupt today's video to let you know that right now, Restaurant Systems Pro is offering a no strings attached 60 day trial that will help you improve your systems, increase your profit, and find better work life balance. All you have to do is click the link below we are used to our work speaking for ourselves we would never go out and say see this awesome thing that i made because everybody would tell you hey you need to come off of that high horse Uh, yes your work is amazing but we don't need to hear about it we have two eyes and we can see it okay um and it has been very called the yandel yeah we have it's called the yandel law the yandel law it's 
technically not a law, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> like a. He coined a guy. Yeah. I think he coined it or something. Yeah, but it it coined that term. Yeah. Basically, just saying. It's a principle. Don't it's a principle. Don't think too much of yourself. We are all on the same uh, level. Uh, Everything and that is in Denmark is very homogenous, mm. and yeah. it's very um, um, equal. Yeah. So, so is, is is the 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 reason to think like this so you don't put yourself ahead of other people or above other people? Yeah. Yeah. Very Which in many instances is really good, but if you don't fit into the nine to five office kind of setting it's difficult to feel like you fit in. And I know it was very difficult for Chris to live out his dream, which is one of the many reasons you wanted to come here. And, you know. So it's like a cultural thing where people kind of look down on the, the, the trades? No. No, in no, general. No, the trades are held up high. Yeah, the Denmark. trades are held up high, but it's so a that general but that's thing. that's equal. That's what I'm talking about, everybody being equal. So you're going to see like the uh, you know the blue collar and the white collar people are almost the same in Denmark. Yeah, yeah. we also don't say uh, ma'am, sir, doctor, you know everybody is by first name. Yeah, I mean I I like that. And honestly like what I was thinking about when you were saying before you don't like to talk about yourself. You don't like to you like it's, it's humility. It's it's being humble and and that's I was always brought up to be humble. And I think in the Western world that we live in, in this individual world we live in, you throw social media on top of that. We're like, how how do you stay humble on social media? Mm -hmm. Social media is all about trying to stand out and to brag and to not yeah. brag, but you know, to like, it's not humble. It's definitely not humble what people are doing on social media. Like, like we live in a world where like you're not rewarded for being humble, and I think that there's an issue with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always amazed about people that they can just talk for hours about themselves. I was like, no, that's not, I don't like that. But we that's also, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, a, and still is a struggle to go out there. And and I think that's one of the reasons we have chosen to maybe grow slow. That we want the products to speak for themselves and that takes time. We yeah. have a network of great chefs that speak on our behalf because they use our product. It is not just us going out there saying, see what we can do. Yeah. Uh, but I love that. I, and like, I always use, so when I talk about business, I think that business is the game of business, right? And the game of business is built by, by a bunch of micro games that you can choose to play. And it's, they, they all accumulate or they come together for the great game of business, right? But you as a restaurant or as, as an entrepreneur or a, if you're listening to us as a restaurateur, you have to choose which micro games you want to play. What games do you want to play? You can choose to focus on doing your thing and being best in class, putting all of your energy into doing one thing and letting the product speak for you. And yeah, it's going to take longer. But it's you're gonna have integrity in, in the work you're doing, and you're, the, the the marketing you, you're doing is word of mouth. That doesn't go anywhere, you know. Yeah. That that's long game. That's sub, that's substance. That's that's value. Or you can play a bunch of other little micro games to like promote yourself, you know. And and that's one way to grow. You'll grow faster, but maybe I don't know. Like I, I think you got to be mindful of the, the what's going through your mind. Like you have to be mindful of the games you choose to play. What are you thinking as I'm saying this? I mean, I. I totally agree and for us it's a I think it's a chosen strategy that integrity, quality and honesty has to be in everything we do. Uh that means that we are selective about who we work with. We are selective about the things we do. Um and we cannot lower our quality to accommodate somebody's budget. We are going to work with their budget but not not if, not if we believe that it's not doable and we are definitely not going to do something we don't believe in. Like in the beginning, a lot of people approached, approached us on doing systems that we did not believe in. And, you know, Chris just said, I can't do it because that would go against everything that I'm standing for. Yeah. Uh, so it's not that I don't want your business, but I, we are not the right people for you. You can't afford us. Like yeah. <laughs> we, ha we have... Um, um, our grill that um, moves the grill grate up and down is a crank handle. You just pull on it and it moves it's the grill literally grate literally right behind you. If you're watching the video of this, head over to YouTube.com slash Restaurant Unstoppable. You can see just beyond Chris the, the handle he's talking about. Keep going. And because um, and a lot of people had a you know, wheel and yep. then you 
you work that wheel and then it goes up and down but uh, I was always you know I I d never really liked that idea I you know to me it seems like it'd be more economical just to pull on something you want it it's a very simple motion you want the griddle grate to move up and down you want to do as little work to do and that and as fast as and possible. as fast as possible <laughs> to do that especially when whatever you're cooking is burning yeah <laughs> so it's like oh oh my food's burning just pull on it and it's out yeah. of the way yeah and um you know make it go up and down it's it's fairly simple yeah no i love that uh, so i mean we're what what is important to you i want to talk a little bit about uh, how you guys came to america how you realized that you weren't going to do furniture like how you evolved and pivoted to be what you are today but what are the most important things that you talk about thereafter like put some like give, give me an agenda like what what's important to you chris in regards to what what we discuss like what to talk about yeah the most important thing uh, i like to talk about uh the grills Okay. Okay. We'll get into the yeah. rest. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, but I am curious. I think the listeners want to know too. Like, what, like, so you come to the United States, 2014. We came in two 2014, and it's it's not as easy to get into America as you would think it is. So uh, I've heard horror stories. Yeah, exactly. So we spend our savings uh, on some time here building a business plan and. Then after a while, we applied for um, a visa back in Denmark, and we got. So we had to set up the entire business, invest all of our money, and then hope to get the visa. Wow. And I mean, this officer at the embassy was letting us sweat for quite some time. I mean, <laughs> we were in our twenties, and I mean, who are these people that think that they can build their own business and make it happen? Uh, but we got the visa, and then. It was just, I mean, we had to prove both to the system and to ourselves that we could be profitable from day one. But and we didn't know. When you say like the system, you're talking about the, the, the government. <laughs> yeah, Immigra I mean, immigration. Yeah. it's the immigrations. Uh, we it's had to pressure. Like, you know. we had never um, had our own business before. We knew nothing. We don't know anything about running a what business. What were some of the, the biggest challenges for you early on that you learned the hard way? Uh, everything <laughs> like everything. we we knew we didn't know where anything was <laughs> when we came over we didn't here. know anybody we didn't know what suppliers to use we didn't know where to find customers we didn't even know how to get a, a driver's license <laughs> over here <laughs> but you figured it out right yeah. yeah and i i think back now and say if i had known what i had to go through would i have done it i don't think that i would have dared to do it i think that's why they say ignorance is bliss yeah, yeah. Because I Definitely. mean, like when I was, like I can relate to that statement. Doing this podcast, like I, I started this podcast to learn from the best, so I could go out and open my own restaurant. After speaking to nearly a thousand restaurateurs, I'm like, I'm gonna <laughs> tap the brakes a little bit on this, <laughs> you know? Like I, yeah. I'm almost scared straight. Uh, and I, but but sometimes you just start, and then you once you start, you're invested. Yeah. And you don't want to quit, right? But if you know that anxiety is gonna keep you from ever starting. Yeah, but I think we've been pretty similar in the sense that, I mean, giving up is not even an option. I right. mean, we never talked about giving up. We always talk about how can we develop. Um, if we can see, like with uh, the pandemic, that we're going to run into some issues, like, you know, the whole restaurant industry is closing down. Okay, how are we approaching it instead of, oh, is this going to take us out? Because nothing is taking us out yeah you're unstoppable yeah yeah i love it so w you said you didn't know anybody you didn't know where to start you just kind of had to start and figure it out as you went um we were talking earlier off air you're producing 73 of these these major grills that are behind you right now um a year i mean and, and the numbers are going up from what i understand too There's mm -hmm. the, the demand is going up i mean it's grills from these what i call a small grill and up till you know 16 17 sometimes 20 feet yeah so long the, grills so that uh, one behind you is what four feet maybe three feet three feet three feet um that's on like and you have like other grills like like you have stoves and stuff you have you have a bunch of stuff you do is it safe to say these two um models behind you are like the the like the no no, no. no i would wait. say we have mid-sized grills mid from grills. six sixty to 72 inches is usually what people order uh, the more customized one is the one that are 
from eight feet and up where people really get to play um, and then there's the like what do you want to do Chris projects uh, that we thankfully have some of where he can just completely go into his own mind he and it's not just here it's at home he watches movies that inspires him uh, you know different uh, talks with different people he goes to visit the sites where the restaurants are going to be he interacts with the chefs to get to pick their brain not just on food but who are they and what is this place about and then goes in you go kind of go into your own mind on what do I imagine for this place mm. um, and that's really where you get your energy from Yes, we love doing all the, what we call standard setups, but we have an amazing team that knows how to build all of our stuff uh, so Chris can get time to do all the specialized stuff, develop in that sense. We're very different from most other companies that spend a lot of time on engineering something and then they put it into production kind of the opposite Chris is like how do I get this to work we build it as you believe it has to be done we test it and then you figure it out and not until you figured it out do we actually do the the drawings and stuff um, because for you it's it's not just the engineering of it it's I mean, does it really work? Yeah, but the, the process you're describing is like the it's a it's a the, like the startup like the lean Eric Reese lean startup I think is the name of the podcast. There's a, a specific term for what you're describing. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's the idea of just starting with a minimal viable product, uh, and just every rendition of it do a little bit better. Get that yeah. feedback. Talk about like little tweaks, and over time, working with your customers just improving your process, learning as a professional, as a mm -hmm. technician, like it, that's the only evolution is better over time, mm -hmm. you know? And that's that. And then that's the more like most people don't have the budget to put thousands of man hours into one project. Like big corporations have the budget to do that. But most people have to start where they can small, like you did in scale, constantly improve over time. I love that approach. That's, that's one of the reasons uh, or, Grill system is is a, a good system because it's a, it's a modular system. Everything that goes into our hearths are easily removable, easy to install, and um, and you can always add to your grill. Yeah. So I know Chris, we're gonna um, like I, I want to know what the when did you know you were gonna go from f like furniture to grills? What happened? We did a uh, we did furniture a few years and um, and kind of got it out of my system. I didn't like it as much as <laughs> I thought I was gonna. Why not? It's I, cause I want to build um, my own stuff, really. Yeah. A lot of times, you know, furniture, unless you have a, a big name, it's not yours. You don't really. get to create, but you have to create for what other people yeah. demand. Yeah. 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 But the grills, um, is different, cause we're dealing with chefs, and um, and uh, they want the function, so I can come up with the function, uh, with the chefs, and then I can do my own design, basically. Yeah. So, y were were you working with restaurants early on with the furniture? Th was that your target? Yeah, market? that was basically uh, furniture uh, for a restaurant. And uh, they're giving pictures. you their vision for what they want the furniture to yeah, look like. Yeah, we would like. receive drawings and then obviously give our input on, you know, is this structurally right or not? Yeah. But it would be their design. Was it stainless steel furniture? No. Oh, I was gonna say because that would have been kind of. It cool. was like you know anything like wood uh, up to um, metal. Uh, you know, not 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 too much stainless. But um, my passion's always been in stainless, I think. Mm -hmm. I think I you were just tired yeah. of it for a while. Yeah, because building industrial food equipment isn't always the most fun because everything you do is very beautiful, but nobody ever sees it Yeah, because it's inside of a factory. Right, right. And it's important to be seen. Even if the, the Danish say, you know, don't be seen, it's okay, like be humble. I think at the end of the day, we also need to be seen. We have to be recognized for our work. You want that work? It's to be more shown. fun, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, to see if people like what you do, or if they if they don't like what you do, you know, what you do. All those are important, I think. Right, right. So you you make the pivot to grills. What triggering event was there? What why did you build a grill? 
um, basically uh, we you know were doing furniture at, at a restaurant and uh, and uh, they you know needed grills so and then uh, we were talking about you know different you know ways to do it and it just kind of slowly morphed into um, morphed into that they needed a grill later on and then I was like okay let's build one so was what was the first grill like was it anything like what we see behind you guys yeah the very first grill was um, was basically almost exactly what it looks like now yeah the one behind you Mon- um, behind you. So um, coming we'll up with the for elevator. For people system. listening to this too, uh, we're going to be taking a lot of photos, getting a lot of video. So if you want to see what we're talking about, I highly recommend watching this on YouTube. Again, uh, youtube.com slash restaurant unstoppable. S- please subscribe while you're over there. Why not? Uh, so behind me is what you was closer to the first rendition of what you built. Yeah. yeah. And, and talk, talk us through that. The first rendition was that they need, you know, you need a hearth and you need a, a grill that can uh, move up and down. So that so the hearth is th- where the where where the the foot the, the the wood falls and and it holds the heat. It yeah, it's yeah. the the, ba- the base. Yeah, and then uh, you need a burn box and you need an elevated uh, grill system. So why do you need a, a burn box? What what's the significance of having that in the system? So that I think that goes back to the Argentinian way of grilling, where you. Uh, Break down firewood into embers, and then you're cooking on the embers. Yeah. So the so the the burn box sits behind the grill, and you you start the fire there, and as it burns, it drops, and you have the embers that you use for grilling from be- from beneath on the hearth. Yeah. Yeah. But you can also you also get heat from that wood burning in the back. So now you're getting heat from the bottom and the back. Yeah. Right? Is, is Exactly. Is that part of the process? Yeah, and and the reason it's in the back also is that it's easier to move something towards you than taking something from the side, for example. So if you're pulling the coals, so what you're saying is as the coals are falling out of the burn box yeah. on the back, they're hitting the ground, and it's easier to pull those coals forward. Exactly. And you build the tools to do this, too. You don't just hand your clients the grill, smack them on the ass, and say, go get it. Like you give them the tools, like you give them the yeah. like the, the 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 shovels and the, the tools to yeah. manipulate the exactly. The like for example, the um, everything uh, we do is kind of you know just kind of we want to go in and look at every single little detail and say why is it that a shovel needs to be this? Like what's the ultimate best way of having a shovel pick up charcoal? Mm. And um, you are a nerd, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, ver- <laughs> you can ver- you can nerd out on it a lot if you want. <laughs> um, but uh, for example, you know the the rake is also has uh, the same V shape as the um, uh, grill grate. So the grill grate that V shape that collects the juices into a little reservoir. Um, those V shapes uh, are the same on the gr- on the rake. So you can use it as a rake for the charcoal, or you can also clean. The grill grade with the same tool, so, so functionality too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that wasn't always the case. You didn't always have these 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 features on the grill. Like, how long no. did it take for those little details to, to come out over most trial? Like most of the time, like we pretty much had it from almost the beginning. A lot of the stuff, but yeah, some of the stuff get um, you know perfected uh, over time. It gets perfected, but it also gets developed because you talk to people. You go, you call clients and say, "Hey, how's it going?" Uh, what could we do better and how can how can we make s- you know what what are you missing to make it the ultimate setup like you know we started out with the regular hand grill that we sell a lot of that turned into ah uh, could could you maybe do something with like a um, perforated so so it's kind of like a little recessed area okay we can try that that was a success then somebody called one day and said I need to make oysters. How do we make that happen? And you how did you make that happen? You guys create like a little tray that a little holds hand o- grill. Yeah. yeah, you can move around that holds yeah. the oysters so they don't don't tip over. You so know, it's same same principle as the first one. It's just a different version of it, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, so w- in your opinion, what were the biggest evolutionary elements, or, f- or, or um, just add-ons as you're evolving th- your grills? Given you know every repetition you get, every piece of feedback you get, what were the the, the biggest evolutionary points for you and your grills? Do you the think? biggest evolution in the grills, I think, was that it was completely modular. 
What do you mean by that? Is it like that on wheels? Like, like, like no, move? that means that anything that went into the harp was easily removable, or you could add to your grill even after you got it. Okay, so, so the if you get your what's the word I'm looking for? The utility, um, modular, I guess is a great word, mm-hmm. but like you can you can manipulate the grill to f- to fit your unique. Yeah, it's not a, when you get it, it, it doesn't have to stay that way. You can yeah. move it or almost like a puzzle pe- or um, like Legos. Yeah, exactly. exactly. We have we have a lot of people thinking, OK, we buy a, an eight foot unit. We have two of the grill towers and one oven. The oven is in the middle. But then along the way, they figure out, oh, we actually don't use the oven in the middle. We would like to put it to the left. OK, I mean, it's heavy. It's not. You don't just move it, but you can just switch places. Yeah. Or you can take the oven out. We have seen people take their ovens out for events, uh, put them out on their uh, patios instead. A lot of people get um, mm. uh, rotisseries installed afterwards, like big rotisseries. What yeah, are they the Peru- Peruvian, Peruvian uh, yeah. Yeah. rotisseries. We also have people coming saying, okay, I'm, a, I'm on a budget. What can we do within my budget? And I say, okay. How much space do you have? Okay, you have uh, uh, 96 inches. This is my suggestion is that you go with as simple a setup as you can. And then as you go, you can build to it. Because it's modular. You can add pieces. It's modular. You you might not be able to afford the oven now, but you you can afford it later maybe. Start where you can. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a great. And the fact that your grills give people the option to do that is huge. Yeah. S- because, I mean, usually, like, it's it's fixed. Whatever you get is fixed. Like, you, yeah. like you're saying, like, being able to have a modular grill that can adapt and evolve as you evolve and adapt. Because that's where you pointed out, you and your careers, you weren't the same in the beginning. You mm. evolve. Your business, your restaurant evolves, too. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I think that's huge. Like so, so many times we, we have a vision for what we think our restaurant's going to be. And then we start. And then like you say, either ergonomically things aren't in the right place or we change the menu and we know that the equipment affects the menu. Right. Yeah. So like, I like mean, that's things a, change. That's a really big thing for us is that you have to be able to adapt to what comes to you. Uh, yes, you buy a $50,000 grill and everything is fixed in it, but you don't need half of it. Then why would you? technically purchase all the stuff you don't need yeah i mean start where you can have a vision for the things you'd like to do and it is literally everything you so we itemize everything so you know the hearth is one thing the tower is one thing the top shelf or the drying rack the you know everything is itemized yeah everything you you see on our website on instagram you can pimp your grill yeah Yeah. exactly yeah it's it's basically just uh, we don't have models everything's suggestions so it don't necessarily cost that much to do it that way um, because we you know building everything as modular and everything is kind of fits together as we do is very easy to build like a a a three foot grill it's almost the same it's the same principle as a 20 foot grill yeah it's just uh, it's it's very easily scalable i'm visualizing like a 1995 like honda civic stock model base model that you can just like add like 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 pe- different like i don't know i'm not a car yeah. person at all you can tell <laughs> but like uh what, what do they call this like the, the the molding around the bottom of the car w- different rims spoilers yeah. like yeah. A- as you get more money you can like change your car you can get the things you want i mean th- yeah. that's a good uh description of yeah, it because i destroyed it but i, I mean tried. <laughs> you can even uh obviously if you're on the podcast you can't see it but if you go to youtube you can see some of the the ovens here i mean some have uh, brass trim some have stainless trim you know how does it fit into your restaurant Branding, design yeah. um uh what what type of oven do you need we have yeah we uh, have, i think we have like um six different styles of ovens now uh, so you have the hearth uh open grill with the the back rack and the the hanging racks and all that but you also do ovens uh live fire ovens so I, would you say the ovens and the grills are your two major products yeah, yeah. i would say um the ultimate setup is that you need an elevator tower mm. and you need an oven. That's the two uh, most important things. To Why do you need so the elevator tower, that's the rack that goes above. Yeah. No, that it yeah, it goes up and down, moves up and down. Oh, okay. That that's the grill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so and for example, the grill grates on both of them are made the same size so you can easily swap around. 
Yeah, so you can take from the grill tower and directly into the oven or the other way around. And having an oven, there's literally nothing you cannot make in a live fire oven, uh, whether you use uh, 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 firewood or charcoal. I mean, we have ovens that are specifically made for uh, uh, firewood, and we have some that are specifically made for charcoal. And you can use them, you know, all together, but some of them just like slightly different in airflow and stuff like that to kind of make it, you know. What would be variables that would make me choose between a w- wood oven or a charcoal oven? It's um, charcoal oven has a um, more restricted airflow and also a, f- a more fine uh, air adjustment system. Um, for example, when you have um, an oven and um, and some ovens have a glass door so you can see everything that's going on in there, and you put a piece of meat in there, you don't want your meat uh, to catch on fire, but you want intense heat. So you need to be able to adjust the airflow perfectly so you get the most amount of uh, heat, but then uh, no flame around. Um, so it needs to be able to have less oxygen so you don't get that flame around. So the your charcoal your meat. gives you that controllability of getting it just as close to where it can get without combusting the meat, yeah, essentially. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's also, for some clients, it's a matter of what are they allowed to have in their restaurant. Some well, that's something that I was hoping yeah. we would be able to talk about. I mean, I really, I know, I could tell that Chris was chomping at the bit to talk about the grills, and I, I could see him that's getting emotion. excited. That's the most. So I, I wanted that to come out. I wanted that passion. I'm to not come as. Out. I, I don't think I'm as interesting as the grills. But, <laughs> <you know. laughs> uh, but I think I, I think there you you do get to work with restaurants, um, very successful restaurants. Name some of your clients. If you, is, do you, are you able to do that? Just to give our listeners yeah, I perspective. Yeah, I mean, uh, you have been to a few of them. Uh, you visited uh, Sujan in in uh, Chicago. Yeah. Uh, he's a very good client of ours that we work with uh, for several years yep. and are still working with he's actually coming to see us this week we have many uh, in atlanta we have Nashville lots of in, uh, atlanta uh, we recently did a big resort in um, just outside of nashville uh, most people know that we have worked with uh, sean brock um, uh, i mean it's all over the place uh, i would say there's no set kind of client we have uh, it's more I think it's more who fits us uh, and our personalities. Well, I just, I just kind of want the, the listeners to get an idea of who you're working with. Like, people who have very high standards who are the, mm-hmm. the best at what they do. Uh, you create grills for the best in the industry. Yeah. Um, and they've given you a, a lot. So you have access to these ama- amazing minds who are giving you, I'm sure they don't, they're not afraid to tell you what you can do better, right? Oh, and yeah. And you put that to use. You put mm-hmm. this advice into your grills. You've evolved this thing to be something that's amazing. But also, you're in there every day talking about the the different variables that affect whether or not you can do live fire cooking uh, and overcoming those variables and working with the space and and. Maybe you might have to adjust the space to be able to permit having a, a grill like this inside the space. Like, what are some of the challenges? Where I'm going with this? What are some of the challenges that come with live fire cooking? If we're listening to this, if we're we're a fan of your grills and we want to use your grills in our restaurant, like what are the variables we need to consider if we want to use one of your amazing grills in our restaurant? Like, what what is the first questions we need? The to biggest ask obstacle is your hood system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because there's um, you know, um, what's it called? In yeah, you need a solid, solid fuel. fuel. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, you need a solid fuel hood. It is uh, more expensive than a regular. So when you're saying hood. solid fuel, you're talking either wood is charcoal yeah, considered fire. solid. It yeah. Yeah. Um, but you can get away with a lesser hood with charcoal, I think. Um, but again, I mean, we always refer to the professionals, but we do point out you need to be aware. You know, and you have to have so much extra. So if you have, uh, if you have eight feet, please make sure that you understand that your hood have to be bigger, uh, so that we don't suddenly it have to be into a, building a certain amount of inches bigger than the grill. For what are the biggest headaches that your clients have ran into trying to get one of your grills into their restaurant? It's the hood is the big. Have you run into that situation where the hood wasn't big enough to? The grill? No, 
usually most people do have some kind of consultant like a that that is aware of yeah like an equipment supplier or that can guide them but sometimes they don't and it is a learning curve for us as well to know what to advise people on so it's different th- around the world and in yeah i was gonna say and, and and different different states. even even the same state different counties can yeah. have like in nashville you different have cities Within in a Nashville, a state, you yeah. have to have an 18-inch overhang on y- on, on the sides side. and the front, whereas in other counties, it's only, you know, six so inches. So combined 36 inches, you're losing. Yeah. yeah. Um, on top of that, there is some, depending on what kind of building you're in, there's some restrictions on uh, whether you're even allowed to use solid fuel. Some say, okay, you can only use charcoal. Uh, because it has to vent out so and so way, and that's not possible in this kind of building. So or is it just the fact that solid fuel burns so hot? Yeah. That you need. Uh, w- what is different about a solid f- fuel g- hood? Is it the amount of air that is it can? It is it the ansel system that's on there? The and what system? The ansel system. What's that? That's the fire suppression. Got it. System that's on there. So it's mostly the difference between uh, a non-solid fuel hood and a solid fuel hood is the fire equipment, the the fire extinguisher, essentially. Yeah, basically. Yeah. You're going to have some with foam and some with water. I think I, I'm not exactly sure. Do you know the, the cost difference between a non-live fire hood versus a five? No, like no that varies. Thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars. Yeah. I think it's thousands, thousands of thousands. dollars. It's very, like all those hoods are very expensive. Yeah. So, I mean, this is something to keep in mind. If, you've yeah. been b- if you're building a concept around a live fire grill, budget for the hood and start yeah. thinking. Do you guys work with any hood manufacturer? Do you have relationships because you guys go no. hand in hand? No, n- not necessarily. You should be an affiliate. You should yeah. probably earn a commission selling yeah. these things. <laughs> 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 Just throwing that out there. Um, so... Any other variables about using live fire li- in in a closed space, indoor space? If people are listening to this episode, they're going, "Those grills sound so sexy." Yeah, I would how say do I get one? Like, what are the things that will s- that will keep like, people from being able to use your grill? Not necessarily. Um, I had like uh, something to be aware of. For example, is that uh, working on the grills can be very hot to work on. Mm. Could, that's why we, for example, develop like half doors that move up and down. To protect you from uh, the, all that. We actually saw heat. that when we were in uh, Miami. Um, the name of Fable Restaurant. Yeah. They were showing us that. Um, that there's like a, a way to basically. Yeah. It's, it's like a door that to comes up. Yeah. To yeah. help the and heat. It, uh, it moves up and down uh, vertically without flipping. So it's always a table. No matter if it's up or down. Because you can use it for condiments. Yeah. and and uh, cutting boards and um, and you know to hang stuff on basically. So maybe, d- is there a size of kitchen that your grill? You don't want a small kitchen if you're if you're working with. It doesn't sizes. matter really. It can like a lot as of. As long as you can deal with the heat. No, <laughs> but uh, y- the heat can. It's uh, everything is um, everything I think in the world is engineering problems. You can always come up with a mm. engineering solution to solve uh, all these problems actually. Yeah. But I mean, from a building perspective, and what you have to think about is also okay i want a live fire grill i want it to be custom made okay you cannot order it today and expect it delivered in four weeks there is a supply i mean (laughs) there has supplies issues uh, but it also takes time to figure out from our side what who are you what kind of grill system is perfect for your setup and then from going from there and to building it Uh, so there is lead times and I always recommend that people place their order which also includes a deposit uh, as soon as they can because the lead time I give you today might not be the lead time that I give you in four weeks it depends on how many orders I got in coming ahead of you so or if something happens in the market and suddenly there's a low supply on some specific or the cost of goods go up yeah um uh, so sometimes i got you in trouble during the pandemic you quoted people i think i remember talking about this yeah the first time we came by you had quoted people uh you know this is what it's going to cost and then the pandemic hit and the supply shortage the cost of goods went up and you 
We I ate that want, cost. I was gonna say, yeah. and this is a testament to the kind of the, the, the kind of people you are. You, you ate that cost. You you yeah. you stay true to the quoted. You know, like people are building yeah. out restaurants that like they don't have a lot of extra budget. They don't like sometimes can't afford to go yeah. spend an extra couple thousand dollars here and there. Yeah. So I mean, I for most parts honor the contract, even though the it's ex- you know even if a, a a quote has expired. Yeah. I will do anything I can to still make that happen. Yeah. Uh, when they come back and is ready to order. But then again, that's why it's so important that, you know, place your order as soon as you can because you get on the schedule. And when you're in the middle of construction, there you're going to forget stuff. And sometimes that stuff is forgetting to purchase equipment. Yeah. And, and we've come across that a couple of times where people are like, oh, um, we're kind of like needed in six weeks. And it's like... I'm not sure I can do six weeks, but, you know, we can maybe accommodate eight weeks. But I also have to discuss with my team, you know, do they, are they in on it? Do they want to take on the extra hours so we can make it happen? Uh, and for most parts, everybody is in on it and um, and we make it happen. Uh, but, you know, be aware that custom made items and even these days equipment that are off shelf also takes a long time to arrive yeah um sometimes we have clients asking us to build grills into other equipment so it kind of fits into their uh, line like of cabinets or and and we need to get that equipment before we can even do anything yeah you need to you gotta make sure it's even possible yeah um so lead times is is a thing we highly recommend that for people that are able to to come here and see us. Uh, right next to the airport. Yeah, we are like five minutes <laughs> from the airport. They can be forty five minutes additional every we day just to be close to the airport. Even if you're considering getting a grill but you're not sure, we have people that fly in, come here, they cook for a few hours, and then they leave again. Um, and then you know, some need uh, some time to chew on it because. That's another aspect of live fire cooking. It's a learning curve. Yeah. I was going to ask this. I wanted to wrap up with any other variables that we're not considering. If somebody's listening to this because they are going the pursuit of, of live fire cooking in their restaurant, what are the things that people just don't consider beyond just the grill and the hood? Like, what are the benefits of live, live fire cooking? But also, like, what are, like, the, the, the cons of things you don't consider? I mean, the bin. Can I? Yeah, you can the benefits that. are definitely that you catch the audience. Yeah, it's the show. It's the show. Most people do have it, so it's visible. Yeah, I was um, gonna say flavor. Like and, and the flavor the profile. Best. Sure, it's, it's the best. You're not gonna get uh, the same kind of flavor. Yeah, it's the best. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think uh, there's. Sorry, keep going. Uh, you're right. The flavor and then the the show that you put on. But the obstacles are also that you might have a lot of people moving through your kitchen and you want to make sure that, you know, you keep your equipment maintained. So uh, you and that goes through, you're talking about turnover. Yeah. Or like the actual people walking past the grill. No, the, the turnover, turnover in the I kitchen thought. that you want to make it clear that equipment of any kind, we're not just talking about... Uh, uh, grills, but it has to be maintained. What does and that maintenance look like? What what level do we need to budget? Like a no, okay. I d- I wouldn't say uh, you need to budget anything. I mean, you need to clean it. I, it has soot. It has ashes. Uh, it has grease from whatever you're cooking. Yeah. If you keep it clean, obviously you cannot keep it looking new. Brand new. But right. I- but if you do wipe it down, if you do clean it. It is going to last you like for so long and you're not going to run into major issues. Is it a challenge to clean? And I don't think so, personally, because it's uh, it's modular. I mean, the tower can literally be taken out with like a fi- two finger screws and then you can scrub it down. Is it? Do you um, ever see people damaging the grills by trying to clean them? Is that something that we should like? Is there a way to The only advise? thing you can do is say. Uh, you know, if there's something that's brushed go the wrong way on the grain, then uh, that's going to not damage it, but it's going to make it look worse, I think. Yeah. yeah. And 
I mean, there is a couple of general rules, but I think that might go for any kind of really hard equipment. Don't, don't. I mean, it needs to cool down naturally. That was I was gonna ask. Yeah. So don't, yeah, don't do not don't, don't pour water on it. Don't pour water on to cool it down. What happens with stainless steel is that once it cools, it it's supposed to go down to its natural state where it came from when it cools down. Yeah. But if you cool it down too fast, it's gonna stay in whatever position it cooled down in, uh, which is what can make it warp. But tr- uh, stainless steel, uh, it it cools fast, doesn't it? Pretty quickly, no. Yeah, I mean it, it's yeah, it cool down it's faster aluminum, than but <laughs> like cool down faster than mild steel, I think. Yeah. yeah. So the big things I I got the things to consider. Um, know that there's going to be work on maintaining the grill and 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 training around that. Make sure there's training because like, I think what you're pointing out is. I that mean, you wanna you want it to last as long as possible. Yeah. So like when you get the grill, whatever the standard is at that time. As far as the training that you, I'm sure you probably offer training, like when you go, we probably don't just drop the grill off and say, "Here you go." Yeah, There's we probably do, we do. Um, um, we give them our number and uh, we do FaceTime and we can mm-hmm. do all, all sorts of different stuff. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't discussed up to this point? I just want to make sure there's ever any benefit, any anything that you want to make sure we communicate to the listener that has not yet come out yet. What 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 do they need to know? Good question. Um, I mean, again, th- it comes in here that we don't like to talk about ourselves. Yeah. So you know, I would. I would just say maybe that um, that I think uh, our name, you know, our name is on the product. So we, my goal is that all my equipment is always working how it's supposed to. Yeah. yeah. So I'm very interested in having all the grills that we build always be functional. And if there, I w- would hate to see anything that you know where it was broken somewhere nobody wanted to call us and and um, yeah and you know try and fix it right right um i i've really enjoyed hearing your story um twice now uh <laughs> <laughs> we're, i think we're I, i'm i'm confident we're gonna be able to use this recording it was it was it was rough last time with um the power being out and um i'm, I'm happy that we we're able to come here and to the share your story again and to capture actually capture and we're going to get a tour of the space we're going to be doing uh you're going to take us through the whole process from like getting the the raw material in all the way through uh fabrication to end product so um, i'm excited to see what that footage looks like and we're going to put that on the uh, youtube channel so if you you guys want to see that process and like what goes into making these girls be sure to to subscribe to our channel Uh, but i just also want to say like congratulations like you guys are literally like the like the the living example of the american dream uh, starting where you can starting small uh, getting a little bit better every day evolving pushing yourselves to grow and scale and i i can't wait to see where you guys are in the next 10 years you know it's, it's super exciting to see your growth and what you're doing here and i just want to say like it's, it's an honor to make an example of you thank you thank you and thank you yeah. for coming I of mean, course yeah. Obviously, we wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is our second time in uh, four months. We came back to make sure we get get this. Um, before we say goodbye, any last pieces of advice for any other entrepreneurs out there um, who are maybe adjacent to the restaurant industry? That maybe they're not restaurant tours, but they are entrepreneurs serving restaurant tours. What's your advice? Uh, it Good question. I definitely think it is. You have to try. I mean, the only f- true failure is if you didn't try. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've always said, okay, if it didn't work, it didn't work, but we tried. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that's so important. I mean, one thing I see from a lot of the chefs that come here is that they just try. You know, if some of them have never had to use live fire equipment, and what they do is they they just try what they think they have to do. there's only one way th- to figure th- it out. There's yeah. only one way to figure it out, and that is to try. And it is okay to ask advice. Yeah. Ask, 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 ask. You know, you can never... Some people are going to tell you that, oh, that's my secret, or, okay, but you asked, and you got to know, and so what? Ask yeah. another person. Yeah. Um, I mean, ask questions. Never be too... Yeah, never be too shy to ask. Never be too embarrassed to ask. Just ask questions i'm living proof that it works you people I mean, will answer if you go and you ask yeah, questions yeah chris any any final words any last pieces of, of advice for entrepreneurs out there doing try, doing what you're wanting to do what you've done 
Um, I don't have anything, but I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, you know, my I I think. Um, you know, I just love what I'm doing, and um, and uh, I'm very privileged that I get to do this. So I'm very happy, and um, you know, d I think uh, my advice would be. Um, you know, do it. Find something that you love, and then try and and do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one more question for me that I'm curious about: oh, any advice for couples out there going into business together, husband and wife businesses? I think um, it's it's the most natural thing to do. That's how humans evolved. Um, you know, as long as you do what you what you're good at, stay in your lane. I think it's the best thing. Yeah. And then um, you know, be humble enough and trust. Uh, your partner, so you don't have to be good at everything yourself. Yeah. What about you, Anne? I agree, but also remember that you also have a personal life, and yeah. sometimes when you get really busy, that can be difficult. Then you get children, and they also need attention. Um, remember to stay true to the relationship. Yeah. Take, you know, close down the business. Yep. Sometimes, uh, yes, we also work at home. We should try that, I think, <laughs> also. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, it's definitely been a couple of rough years. Uh, you know, when you're living far away from family and friends, there's you have a new newborn when the pandemic hits. There's nobody to help you. You have to figure out business. But I actually think it make made us closer. It made us stronger because we had issues that we had to get around. How do we make childcare happen? Yeah. How do we make the business happen how do we make our relationship happen and i mean chris is very good at talking about everything i mean sometimes i have to say i don't ca can we just take a break from talking about it <laughs> but it's a really good skill to have in a relationship that you can communicate and get to the bottom of an issue because otherwise you know you just build up and build up and build up and then obviously when you work together and live together, yeah, it, it can for some people become difficult if you don't communicate. So, lots of communication. And uh, what about when you need to communicate to your partner when they need to do something better? Uh, any advice <laughs> around that, particularly to you, Anne? So I think uh, I'm making a joke off of what you said earlier today. There's Anne's no good at the only you. way it works <laughs> is the only way I think it works is that um, you can only do it if you trust each other. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, you have Otherwise to Otherwise, there's no good way of saying it. Yeah. And you have to say it at the right time. Nice. You yeah. know, you don't say it when somebody is frustrated. I, I cannot come in here and see that he's frustrated over something and then, and then say, on top of it. that looks like shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it has to be on a day where he's, where he can take it. And so sometimes I don't say it while I'm looking at it. Sometimes I'm saying it when, you know, we're in a different situation. And I say, you know what, I think could we do this or what do you think about my idea of doing this and then he's like no it's you know then he has a good argument for why it's done it's never just a because i said so or because i you know that's my way of doing it there's all also you know having that argument yeah the best the, ar the, the best argument wins the best argument always wins and that's that's everybody in the shop well, uh, somebody's better at arg arguing like, <laughs> if if you can make a case for uh, why you're doing something, it 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 only means that um, that um, you're thinking about why you're doing something. Yeah. Because um, sometimes you know the excuse of I did, don't know why I was doing it like this that that's not a good way to do anything. <laughs> yeah, like you have to yeah. know why are you doing it this way and not another way. Mm -hmm. And um, you know the person that's sweeping the floors in the shop might have a better idea than me everyone has perspective you gotta yes. open yourself up to it yeah. so yeah, yeah you, you need to be able to um, to ask you know the lowest on the totem pole advice for yep. example yep chris and Anne demont typically this is where i have you call somebody out who do you respect and admire i think would be a great guest on the show you've already connected us with so many people um i don't even know if you you know of everybody that we connected with that you've put us on to but I, I, I think you get a pass on this what one. About, uh, <laughs> what about South Hall? Yeah, I mean, the guys from South Hall in Franklin, uh, Tennessee, has definitely given us a big push. Uh, 
if you do not know of South Hall, it is a um, it's a working farm and inn, uh, a luxury resort, and what they have done for us and for their community has been huge. For us, they gave us the ability to do what he wanted to do and trusted the process, but they also gave us an immense amount of feedback and what they do for their community. I mean, this working farm is just amazing. Um, and, and the people behind it is amazing, which for us is the most we important. We also work with some amazing uh, kitchen designers. Okay. Put them on our uh, yeah. We work a lot with Next Step Design. Um, okay. uh, Russell is, I mean, he is, for us, very valuable in the sense that he's very honest. Yeah. We work a lot with uh, Tina Design, which is uh, Frank and Will. Um, and they're again, very creative they're and creative and, and they're, they're honest. Yeah, the honesty. I mean, that there's no fiddling around with stuff. It is this is what we want. Uh, can we make it happen? And how do we make it happen? So that's next step design, Tina design. And you also mentioned it was a South Pole, South Pole, South Hall, South Hall. South yeah. Hall. Thank you very much. I think that's great. Um, look out, guys. I'm coming after you. I'd love to get you on the show. And if we want to get one of your grills, what's the best way to connect? And what's the minimum time you like to have? Like, if somebody's thinking about opening a restaurant and they want your grills, like, what? how much time? I think you mentioned it earlier, but echo that now. I mean, we would like to get 16 weeks and up, depending on. I mean, obviously, if you only need an oven, we can probably do it faster, but if you need a 20-foot grill with every feature we have, I would like as much time as possible. Four weeks. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, not four, I was going to say four months, sorry. <laughs> yeah, at least four months. Uh, that is our current uh, lowest lead time. Uh, we do allow for a couple of emergencies uh, once in a while uh, because other projects are pushed. If you want to get a grill from us, you can reach us either via our Instagram, which is Grills by Demand, uh, Facebook, also Grills by Demand. You can find us on our website. There's a contact form. Uh, it is me personally who will get back to you, um, at least until the baby comes. Uh, then I'm probably going to take a day or two off. Good for you. Um, <laughs> uh, I will set you up with a call with Chris, or if you already know what you want, uh, let me know, and I'll send you a quote. Uh, um, so that's the easiest way a, to... We do a, a lot of times an itemized quote, and then uh, if they like that, uh, we'll do a 3D rendering so you can see exactly what it's going to look like. Nice. Yeah. And this is episode 977. If you head over to restaurantunstoppable.com slash 977, we'll have a summary of today's discussion as well as the links to any... Um, you know, contact information, the Grills by DeMont Instagram website, so you guys can contact them as well. Uh, and this is just where we say thank you so much for taking the time to share your story, to welcome us in, to set up all of your grills. And I know we're going to do a really great walkthrough. I'm excited for that. And there is no questioning. Chris and Ann, you are unstoppable. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you.